me ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. If you're new, we're going consecutively through this letter of Peter towards the end of our Bibles in the New Testament, Peter being uh, the leader of the apostles, and he writes two letters, and we're thinking of the first one, and we come to chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 10. Peter continues to set out the implications of our so great salvation. We have been singing of all that He has done, and we rejoice in the mercy and the goodness of God accomplished through our Lord Jesus Christ and His redemptive work. We rejoice in that, but Peter uh, in this epistle now challenges us as to the implications of that. And so far we've learned at least three things. First of all, if we have responded to what He has done, we are to be holy. Our lives are to be holy. God is holy. Uh, we've been singing, holy, holy, holy. And this God who is holy commands us to be holy. Secondly, we are to love one another. We've experienced the love of God in our hearts, and now as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to be characterized by love. Peter has said in chapter 1, verse 22, in obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So you're to live a holy life, you're to love one another, and then as we saw last time, two weeks ago, we are to long for the Word of God. Like a newborn baby, we are to long for spiritual nourishment which comes through God's living Word. And now, Peter, in our verses today, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, he sets out something very, very important, and something that we need to hear, that while the Christian life begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I come in saving faith to Christ for salvation and forgiveness. It doesn't end there. We don't live our lives as Christians, as individuals, but God calls us to a spiritual house, to a priesthood, to a holy nation. He has reminded us in chapter 1, verse 1, that we are elect exiles. Here are first century Christians under the Roman Empire, and they are scattered, and they find themselves far away from their homes and their families, but He is reminding them that they are chosen by God. In a sense, then, they don't fit into the world, but they have something far better. They have another world. They have a new community. They have a new home as we'll read, they are the people of God. So now we come to verse 4 of 1 Peter 2. Let me read from verse 4 through 10. <clears throat> I suggest if you've got your Bible and follow it, uh, this message is going to be re-emphasized <clears throat> in your mind as you listen to it, but also as you see the words. Chapter 2, verse 4, as you come to Him, that is our Lord Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the Word as they were destined to do so. But you, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy." What a wonderful passage of Scripture, outstanding as Peter is describing who we are all because of who Christ is and what Christ has done. Now, first of all, in verses 4 and 5, we see that God's people have unique privileges. 
we have unique privileges, and I will mention three of them. First of all, God's people are privileged because we come to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Verse 4, as you come to Him. Isn't that wonderful? That in the gospel, God calls us, and we obey, and we come to Christ. A Christian is someone who has obeyed Jesus Christ. He said in chapter 1, verse 2, at the end of verse 2, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. Chapter 1, verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. We have heard the good news preached. He said at the end of chapter 1, we've heard the gospel, we've heard the call of Christ, and now we come humbly, obediently to Christ. Having received the Word, the Word of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So, becoming a Christian is obeying the call of Christ. It is coming to Christ, to the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that. As the gospel is preached, as I stand here and proclaim the message of the gospel, some of you accept it, and some of you will reject it. John tells us regarding the life of our Lord Jesus Christ in John 1, he said he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as those who did receive them, he gave the power to become the children of God. We don't come to Christ by entering the church. Fundamental mistake. You don't come to Christ when you're baptized. You don't come to Christ when you become a member of a church. You don't come to Christ by entering the church. Rather, you enter the church by coming to Christ. It begins with this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I ask you, have you come to Christ? In the gospel, Jesus stands and says, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, give you rest. The gospel says the one who comes to him, he will not cast out. So the question is, have you come to Christ? Followers of Jesus Christ have come to him. We know Christ. But also, the authentic believer of Jesus Christ, as opposed to the mere professor, continues to come to Christ. It's not that I come to Christ and then live my own life and say, it's wonderful to be saved, my sins are forgiven, and now I can live as I like. That's not the gospel. Peter is writing to Christians. He's saying, as you come to Him, we continue to come to Christ, to worship Him, to love Him, and to serve Him. If you love someone, you want to be with them. How can you say you love someone and you go your own way? No, if we love Christ, we continue to come to Him. In God's sight and ours, as He says so beautifully in verse 4, in the sight of God, chosen and precious. So we're privileged. First, we come to Jesus Christ. But we're also privileged, think of this, that we are living stones in God's house. Now, he's using a metaphor. And he describes Jesus Christ, notice verse 4, as you come to Him, that is Christ the Lord, a living stone. He's not only a living stone, He is a life-giving stone. We come to the Lord Jesus Christ in our sin, in our spiritual deadness, and the one who, is, who has conquered death, who is alive forevermore, He gives us His life, our life, our security. My eternal destiny is utterly dependent on my Lord Jesus Christ. This is why I must come to Him. Without Him, I'm eternally lost. Now, notice what Peter says. As you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men. Down through the centuries, there have been those who receive Christ and those who reject Him. During His own lifetime, what happens to Him? He is rejected. Isaiah the prophet said that would happen. He said of the Messiah, he was despised and rejected by man. 
What did we do to our Savior? Willingly embrace Him? Absolutely not. As we've been singing, we put Him on a cross, rejected by men. That cornerstone, that living stone, has been rejected. He's the living stone, but Peter has already told us that we have a living hope because we've been born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's rejected by the world, uh, but in God's sight, Peter says, he is, again verse 4, in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Rejected, cross. That's not the end of the story, is it? No, he is risen from the dead. He has ascended to his Father in God. He is seated at the Father's right hand. He is now choice and precious. And here Peter, in this passage, is referring to the great Psalm, Psalm 118. If you've got your Bible, would you turn there? Psalm 118. And you'll see how our Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. <clears throat> the psalm probably sung at the Passover. Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected. Does that sound familiar? First Peter 2. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone rejected by man, but in God's sight, choice and precious, and that stone which is rejected by man has become the cornerstone. Verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. As we think of the glorious ascension, the glorious resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can say, yes, man rejected Him. Man put Him on the cross. But in our eyes, this is the Lord's doing. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's often taken out of His context, but it's primarily referring to the great day of the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. The stone is rejected, but in God's eyes is precious, and in our eyes, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, we rejoice, and we also say, as we've been singing today, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. When it was announced that Queen Mary in England in 1558 had died, and that the crown was now, now coming to her half-sister, Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, daughter of Henry VIII. It said that she was reading her Bible, and she was reading this passage, Psalm 118, reading it in the Greek version of the translation from Hebrew into Greek. And as she was told that now you are the new queen, she quoted this and said, it is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes, perhaps a little self-serving. But we rejoice not at the coronation of an earthly queen or king. We don't follow an earthly king or queen, or a president, or a prime minister. We, sign, we serve, and we rejoice that we follow the King of kings and Lord of lords, and although man has rejected him, we can say, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has given us. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Isn't that marvelous to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Now notice, as a result of coming to Jesus Christ, we come to Him. Because He is the living stone, we also are living stones. Verse 5, you yourselves like living stones. Jesus is the living stone. We come to Him. He gives us His life. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. And Peter describes the church, not as Paul does, as the body of Christ, but he describes it as a spiritual house. In this spiritual house, the church, our Lord Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He holds it all together. 
But as we come to Jesus Christ, something marvelous happens. God doesn't leave us as isolated, cold stones to live our Christian life by ourselves. No. We receive spiritual life from Christ, and now we are being built up as a spiritual house. What a privilege. Think of the wonder of the gospel. We are the household of God. Paul uses that in 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. We are the house of God in which God dwells. And so you come, we come to Calvary Church, a local body of Christ, a local household of God. We come as individuals. We drive here, we get out of our cars, and we come into this sanctuary. Individuals, living stones, shaped and placed by our Lord Jesus Christ in special position. Yes, if you're isolated, if you keep away from your fellow believers, you'll become cold. You will not grow. We need one another, don't we? And then the wonder of the gospel, when we come to Christ, we become a living stone in the house of God. It's very exciting at Calvary to see people from all over the United States, all over the world, in fact, coming together, different personalities, different spiritual gifts, different perspectives, and what is the Spirit of God in His mercy doing? He is bringing us together so that together, to use Peter's words, we are being built up as, notice it, a spiritual house. This is something that the world can't do. The world can entertain you. The world can inspire you. The world can make you laugh. The world can make you cry. But the world can never build us up into a spiritual house. What a privilege. We come to Jesus Christ first. Secondly, we're living stones in God's house. Third, we are a holy priesthood. Verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. This is amazing, isn't it? To be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, at the time of the Reformation, astonished people, raised as a monk, astonished people by writing and preaching of the priesthood of all believers. Was that true in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant? Absolutely not. All of the priests came from one tribe, from the tribe of Levi. And once a year, the high priest, and only the high priest, could enter into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. Only doing it once a year. One man could go into the presence of God. But since the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, the veil of that temple has been torn, and now in the New Testament church, please hear me, there are no special classes of Christian leaders known as priests. Some of you grew up in a church tradition where people regarded themselves as priests. They were called father this, father that. Now in the New Testament, isn't Peter saying this? You're built up to be a holy priesthood. He's talking to ordinary people to offer spiritual sacrifices and so on. I recently read one of the applications for membership of this church, and this lady wrote in terms of why she wanted to come to Calvary Church, people with different reasons. But one of the things she said is that she'd come to Calvary Church because all of us were on the same level. I thought that's wonderful, right? I'm not going to wear a special gown. I'm not going to wear a little dog collar. I'm not going to wear a bishop's hat. Have you seen them, these parades with bishop's hats? Uh, I wouldn't mind a bishop's ring that the pastors could uh, kiss, but uh, <laughs> no. In the church of Jesus Christ, we are all priests. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a priest. Every single one of us has immediate access to God. Hebrews 4, 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. The humblest believer, the little boy that receives Jesus Christ as his Savior, can come 
right into the throne of grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, because through the redemptive work of Christ, through what He has done, He has opened up that way so that all of us can enter into the throne room of God. His sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, ended all of the sacrifices. And when we come to communion, communion is not a re-sacrificing of Christ. Communion is not a sacrifice offered by a priest at an altar. Absolutely not. Communion is a supper served from a table to which all of the family of God are invited. All of us stand equal. All of us have sinned. All of us come the same way to the Savior. All of us come to Him. And all of us are being built up in this wonderful holy priesthood. Isn't that what Peter is saying? A living, functioning priest. Not only then are we stones in the house, we are priests in the temple, built up as a living stone in the house of God. Notice it is a holy priesthood set apart and consecrated to God. You say, well, what does that mean to be a priest? He tells us a holy priesthood to offer not animal sacrifices, not bringing your fruit or your lamb to God, no, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We have been doing that this morning, the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of worship. We do that spiritual sacrifice when we serve. As we came here, I saw the last large group outside the sanctuary here being gathered, listening to Malcolm as they're getting their instructions regarding ushering and greeting people. A spiritual sacrifice. We hear the choir singing. We hear the musicians playing. We have people just now in the nursery taking care of our little children. We've got some uh, teaching the, the preschool. What are they doing? It's a sacrifice of service. Do you understand that? It's a priestly act. You're presenting that service as an act of worship to God. Now, if you're in it for yourself, if you're self-serving, self-glorifying, it's not a spiritual sacrifice. You're doing it with a wrong motive. But when you do that, you are acting as a priest in our praise, in our service, in our giving, in our generosity. It's unthinkable in the Old Testament that you'd go into the presence of God empty-handed. Yes, we receive, but we also give. We give financially. And so as we came in today, uh, we put that offering in the basket, or we've offered to the Lord in different ways our financial gifts, offered up as a sacrifice to God. I, I, I think of that. Last night as I write the check to Calvary Church, it's not just a check. This is an act of worship. I'm a priest. I'm demonstrating to God my deep, deep thankfulness of His grace and of His mercy in our life. And of course, the greatest sacrifice, you know what that is? It's of ourselves, isn't it? As we come and surrender and say, here I am, Lord, an act of a priest. A unique privilege, yes, coming to Christ, a living stone, a holy priesthood. But not only have we unique privileges, God's people trust in a unique person. Verses 6 through 8. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen, a precious, and whoever believes in me will not be put to shame. For the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Remember, at Calvary Church, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Here in these verses, Peter quotes from three Old Testament passages, from Isaiah 26, Psalm 118, as we've already read, and Isaiah 8, to establish that in the Old Testament, the Messiah was coming as the choice cornerstone. He's the rock. He's the cornerstone. 
And great care is taken in building, isn't it, as to the choice and the laying of the cornerstone. It's the foundation stone for the whole structure. All other stones are put in place in regard, in relationship to the cornerstone is the point. Who's building Calvary Church? You say, well, we work very hard. We've just elected new elders and, and deacons, and we're going to work hard, and we've got pastors, and we've got hundreds of volunteers, and we're all going to work, and uh, this church is going to grow. Yes, we do have to work. But you know who really is building the church? Christ is building the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I should say, Christ is building His church if we build the church God's way and not ours. So often we think we take some, some church that's growing around the corner and the people are flooding in, and we say, well, we should do it that way. That's not the question, is it? It's not what the church down the road is doing, or your idea or my idea. It's what Christ wants. Calvary Church belongs to Jesus Christ. He's the head. I'm not the head. Please, please, I'm not the head of this church. Neither are the elders or you as a congregation. It's Christ. And we who believe in Him, this is an act of faith, will never be let down, never put to shame, never disappointed. Is there anyone here who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and He has let them down? No. To us who believe, He's precious. He's chosen by God. He is the cornerstone, and we come to Him over and over and over again, don't we, to receive His mercy, His forgiveness, His strength, being assured that He is with us, as He Himself said, for where two or three are gathered together in My name, there am I in the midst of them. What does it mean to be gathered in His name? It's to do it His way, to remind ourselves that Christ is here. He is a cornerstone. Ah, but also, Peter tells us, he's a stone of stumbling, verse 8. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Yes, the same stone that we come to for salvation is the same stone that is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those who don't believe. To us who believe, to us who come to the cornerstone, rather, we receive His life. But that rock, that stone, is a stumbling stone to those who disbelieve. So the central question, uh, really, of humanity, the most important question that anyone could ever ask is, who is Jesus Christ to me? Let me ask you, how would you answer that? Is He a living stone that you come for salvation? Something else? Some substitute? He's the central figure of human history, the central figure of eternity, and as the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, there is no neutrality. You want to sit in the fence, don't you? You want a little bit of Christ and a little bit of the world. You want to obey Christ sometimes and go your own way other times. That doesn't work. No, to us who believe He's precious. To the unbeliever, he's a stumbling block. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 2 regarding Christ. He said he's either a fragrance from death to death or a fragrance from life to life. The same Christ calls us. Some reject him. Some sit on the fence. Ah, but to us who believe, he's choice and precious. Do you see your relationship to Jesus Christ determines your eternal destiny. Either eternal salvation or eternal condemnation. Either you come to Jesus Christ and are saved, or you disobey the Word, verse 8. They stumble because they disobey the Word as they were destined to do. Listen to Peter. You'll get the connection here. He's, he's preaching. This is what he says. Think of his courage as he's preaching to the, the Jewish leaders. He says this, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, 
Yes, they rejected Christ. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. You threw him away. You discarded him. But in actual fact, he is the cornerstone in God's sight, chosen and precious. And then he says this, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's it. Salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. You put him on the cross. God exalted him. This is the day that the Lord has given us. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And our eternal destiny is determined by a relationship to Jesus Christ. A cornerstone or a stumbling stone. God's people trust in a unique person. There's none like him, nor will there ever be anyone like him. And finally, God's people have a unique purpose. This really, in verses 9 and 10, this is the climax of the first section of First Peter. Wonderful words. And what a description he gives of us. This will encourage your brother. This will encourage your sister. First of all, we are set apart as the unique people of God. What does he say in verse 9? But you are a chosen race. He's already told us you're, you're elect exiles and to suffering and persecuted people. These words must have given them great comfort. I am chosen by God. In the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people. Deuteronomy 7 says, God says, I didn't choose you because you're more than the others. It's not that you're a particularly impressive people. I chose you because I loved you. Why did God save me? I don't know. Was I any better than the other boys in my, my class at school? No, no. It was the mercy of God, isn't it? And now, followers of Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile, have been chosen by God. The barrier between the Jew and the Gentile has been demolished through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're now one in Christ, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Brother, don't allow the truth of election to bother you. The truth of election is a tremendous comforting and humbling truth that God in His grace reached down and saved you. Here you are at Calvary Church on the last Sunday of January, isn't it? And God in His grace has brought you. Think of where you could have been. Think of what havoc you'd have made of your life apart from the grace of God. First of all, we're chosen by God. Secondly, we are a royal priesthood, verse 9. For you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. We're priests of the heavenly King. Not just priests, we're royal priests. What dignity. We belong to the King. All of the people of God a royal priests. We're part of the royal family, part of the family of the King of kings and Lord of lords. In verse 5, he says, you're a holy priesthood. In verse 9, he says, you're a royal priesthood. And every single one of us participates in worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I ask you, as you come here on a Sunday morning, don't come as a spectator come as a participant. Don't come as a passive observer of worship, but come to be actively engaged in worship. Yesterday, Good and I were down in the night theater, and we listened to the Charlotte Symphony Youth Orchestra playing. And I thought, you know, they were pretty good. And I uh, was listening. But we were just spectators. We clapped when we were meant to clap. We responded as we want to respond. Totally different this morning, isn't it? That I come, I'm not a musician, I sit there and I come to participate. I come to worship. I don't come just to admire the musicians. They're not putting on a performance that we rate them one out of 10, absolutely not. All of us, yes, led by our musicians, Yes, encouraged 
by our pastor of worship, Tim Hathaway, but all of us are engaged. Wasn't it wonderful this morning when Tim said, voices only, holy, holy, holy. I trust you were singing. You say, I'm not much of a singer. My grandmother used to say, she had a terrible voice. She said, God made the crows uh, as well as the nightingales. <laughs> you may be a bit of a crow, musically speaking, but you can make an, a, a noise. You can try and get the tune. More importantly, you can have a pure heart that you want to praise your magnificent Savior, that once you were lost and now you're signed. Don't stand there like this. Didn't sing my favorite song. No, you, we didn't. Uh, they didn't sing my favorite song this morning either. That's not the point, is it? It's not about you. It's not about me. We're royal priesthood. Think of the dignity of it. Think of the wonder of it, that we can come and sing. And God gives us this gift of music, part of our humanity. God gives us this gift. And think of all of the music going on in the world. And yet we come not just to have music, but to worship our great God. We're a royal priesthood. Also, he says, we are, verse 9, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Ah, Peter likes to remind us of our holiness, doesn't he? Set apart to God. He's told us in verse 15 of chapter 1, As he called you as holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Yes, we rejoice that we're a royal priesthood. Ah, but I've got to act in a certain way. Members of the royal family have to act as members of the royal family. Set apart from all of the unholiness. We're to be distinctive. We're special. I'm to be holy in all of my conduct. And then he says… Again, verse 9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. I love this. He's told us that we're redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We belong to him. In Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, he says of Israel, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. We're God's treasured possession. Do you have some treasure, some gold, some jewelry, something really that you treasure? Uh, at home, your golf clubs, whatever it is, your car, you treasure it. You know what it is to treasure it. Think of this, that we are God's treasured possession. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, you're not your own, you are bought with a price. Christ has bought me. He's paid the price for me with His own blood. I am God's treasured possession. This is my identity. You know, at least two or three times a week <clears throat> as I speak to people, I know I've heard this hundreds of times, where are you from? I'm from Charlotte. No, I mean, where are you really from? I I'm really from Charlotte. <laughs> Been here 18 years, still struggling with the language, y'all. But… Uh, then they say, well, where are you really from? Okay, we go through this. So, well, you know, I'm from Scotland. Oh, Scotland, okay, yeah. Uh, my great-grandfather was Scottish. Okay, who cares, right? Um, <laughs> all of my forefathers were Scottish. And you think, where are you from? Really the question is, where am I going? What's my destiny? Yes, I have a Scottish heritage. Yes, I am now an American becoming one in this beautiful city of Charlotte. Yes, I'm an American citizen, but the most important thing about me is not that I'm Scottish, it's not that I'm an American, it's not that even I'm a pastor. The most important thing is this. If you want to put a label on me, put it Christian. Peter is going to talk, use that word in chapter 4. I'm a Christian. That's my identity. I'm God's treasured possession. That's who we are, isn't it? I'm a royal priest, part of this holy nation. And then he says in verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Tim referred to this, a quotation from Hosea chapter 2. Once we were not God's people, Gentiles, 
One we, once we didn't know God's mercy, ah, but now I've received mercy. You don't deserve it. Remember the story Jesus told? The Pharisee in the temple thanking God he wasn't like other men and telling God all that he did. And then there's the tax collector. He's separated from people. His prayer is a very simple one. It was accepted by God. I trust you prayed it. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. That's it. That's my prayer. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Think of all of the goodness of God over years, that God has showered His mercy upon me and you. You say, well, I've got sufferings, I've got difficulties. I know that. I'm talking spiritually, that you in the grace of God have received the greatest of all gifts, eternal life, a destiny in heaven. Once we were estranged from God, and we're no better than anyone else, and God and His grace has intervened. In my case, raised in a Christian home. Some of your cases, a friend talks to you about Christ. Different ways that God acts in our life, doesn't He, to bring us to the point where we hear the gospel, and we hear the call of Christ, and we come to Him and find rest for our souls and joy and forgiveness of sins, and now we are the people of God. And with all of these blessings, I'll end with where I began this morning. What are we to do? Verse 9, that you may proclaim, here it is, the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Think of all of the care taken in Old Testament worship, giving our very best, and we come and we proclaim God, and we do that with excellence. We do that because of who God is and what He has done in His Son, and we announce that, and we sing, holy, 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 and we sing, wonderful, merciful Savior. And we sing what He has done, not what you have done, not how wonderful Calvary Church is, but the wonder of what He has done. And we proclaim that in our worship, and we proclaim that in our evangelism that our worship and our evangelism must be God-centered. We're called out of darkness into His, I love this translation, marvelous light. As Abu was praying, he reminded us that God dwells in unapproachable light, and I have been transferred from that darkness of my sin into God's marvelous light. And now, as a royal priest, I am to proclaim that in the darkness of our world, as we have as our third theme for the year, I am to shine Christ's light. As you leave here, you're going into darkness, perhaps the darkness of your own home, of your school, the stores, of the banks, of the offices, filled with people who live in darkness. We have a broken, anxious world, don't we? As we remembered in prayer, think of the problems in our world. We could be on the very edge of a nuclear holocaust, couldn't we, with what's going on in the Middle East and with Yemen and the Iraqis and Iranians and all of us. And you say, well, that causes me anxiety. No, it doesn't cause me anxiety. All under God's control. <laughs> Whatever happens, I know I've been transferred into the light that a nuclear holocaust can't take away my salvation. But meantime, in this broken world, we who have experienced so much have these unique privileges, trust a unique person, have this unique purpose in life that wherever we go, you're going to shine Christ's light. Our Father, that's our prayer. You've done so much for us. May we shine with the beauty of Christ. May we display and proclaim our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity we've had to worship you. We know that the Spirit is here as we've sung, as we've worshiped. And pray now that all of us will respond. Some have never yet come to Christ. have never experienced this living stone open their hearts, open their eyes to see the beauty of our Savior who is precious in your sight and in our sight. And we 
who have been saved, Father, help us to shine Christ's light wherever we go, that He is the light of the world, and that those who follow Him shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We ask it all in Christ's name.